William lived in a resort town on the Black Sea coast, where the head office of his holding company, Kuban Prestige, was located. This included a large chain of grocery stores. He was a successful businessman who cared about the business reputation and prosperity of his company. William from childhood strived for success and did not stop at what he had achieved. He was constantly looking for new opportunities to develop his business and improve the quality of products offered by his company. William strived to create a comfortable working environment where every employee would feel valued and important to the company. He realized that satisfied employees are the key to the success and prosperity of a business. This also helped him to maintain a high level of professionalism and quality of work in his company, which, in turn, allowed him to maintain a leading position in the relevant market segment. All employees spoke about him only with gratitude and sincere admiration. William was known to the public as a philanthropist who donated a lot of money to various charitable and social projects. He unselfishly helped those who really needed support and strived to the best of his ability to make the world a better place. William had envious people, and there were followers, especially among the younger generation. He was an inspiration to many people. His example showed that each of us can do something good and help those who need our support. He reminded people that we should be generous and ready to help those in need. Without wanting to, William was a man who left his mark on history. His generosity and unselfishness inspired others to do good deeds, because thanks to such actions in society, formed an understanding that wealth should serve not only for personal satisfaction, but also to help others. It was not uncommon for him to be invited to various events. William, I work for the Department of Youth Affairs. We have a new program we're working on right now. It's called Business Mentor. You've been selected as a candidate. Would you be able to give us some time to participate? How long will this program last? What format will it take? The program is designed to last three months face-to-face -face participation during key phases only. The introductory event is a conference with discussion of interim results with all participants in the finals. That is a total of one face-to-face -face participation per month, all the rest within the schedule, remotely. Any variant of interaction via messengers, social networks, email is acceptable. Do these formats and modes suit you? I guess so. Just explain when I can familiarize myself with the detailed plan of events and schedule. I will send you everything by email this week. Now we will finish the preparatory activities, summarize the results, and send all those who agreed to participate the necessary documents. Okay. I'll be waiting. Thank you so much for agreeing to participate. You're an asset to us. If you had refused, the program would have suffered a significant loss. You're a true living legend. Many aspiring entrepreneurs have asked if you will be among the mentors. Of course, the honey barrel was not without tear. There were those who did not share his views and considered William a show-off. In particular, this opinion was held by some competitors, for whom William's very existence was a real bone in the throat. Their lives would have been much better if he had never appeared on their horizon. This William is just an upstart from dirt to princes, and now he will teach us how to build a proper business. It was a common saying among local businessmen. Yes, Alex agrees with you on that point. We have a family business, my grandfather started it. We have been working the old-fashioned way for centuries. We've never been in trouble. And then this William came along, with his fancy stuff. Everybody's talking about him. People tell each other about his loyalty programs. And now, when someone comes to us, whether it's a potential client or a candidate for a vacancy, they compare us to Cuban Prestige Holding and turn their noses up at us. They haven't even had time to try it yet, and they are already dissatisfied with something. From every iron only hear about this William and his achievements. Where did he come from? Who's behind him? A simple man cannot rise so quickly and hold leading positions for a long time without the support of an influential person. What do you think about that? Jack, I've been going through my channels on this little man. He's a dark horse. Common lore. Orphaned by his grandmother in some local village. He was unknown in business circles until a certain point. Then he just suddenly appeared on the horizon with his business project, and received a grant from the governor for business development. There's more. But I don't believe in such sob stories. My gut tells me they're just fairy tales for the common man. In any case, he's someone's brother or brother-in-law. Just look for connections not in our region. So guessed periodically and puzzled over the success of William his competitors, his laurels did not give them rest. 
Meanwhile, he did not pay attention to the envious people's intrigues and continued to expand the sphere of his presence and influence in the region. William also built with his own money a private clinic for the health of the nation on the outskirts of the city, where in addition to paid services there was a social program for certain categories of people, including pensioners, large families, the disabled and low-income citizens. He wanted to help people who could not afford expensive treatment to receive quality diagnostics and therapy. He also thought about the need for such help in his early childhood. He grew up in a village where many people faced financial difficulties and could not afford expensive treatment. William decided that he wanted to do something really useful for his native land and help fill the existing gaps in the social policy of the region. So the decision was born to build a modern private clinic where people could receive high-tech medical care on favorable terms without long waits for budget quotas. William invested all his savings in this project to ensure accessibility of medical services for the city residents and visitors from nearby settlements and villages. He created his own program, in which everyone from certain socially disadvantaged categories of the population could participate. On the opening day of the clinic, slogans were heard from the podium, reminding the older generation of their socialist past. Dear friends, citizens and residents of the region, Kubans, I am glad to welcome everyone present at the opening of our medical center. For my part, I promise that I will do my best to maintain and protect the health of the nation. I did not choose this name by chance, it is very symbolic. It is also the place where you can count on social justice, which is in short supply in today's world. In our center, everyone is truly equal. We do not divide people by class and rank. We don't care what your social status and income is. We are all human beings and everyone has equal rights available to them from the moment of birth, including the right to life. And this life should not be a constant struggle for existence, but a comfortable one with all the benefits of civilization. We do not live in a jungle but in a modern society. After these words in the crowd there was a roar of approval, which grew into a standing ovation. The clinic was equipped with the most modern equipment and provided a wide range of medical services. The health center of the nation quickly gained popularity in the region. As with all of William's endeavors, people from all over the region and even from other regions came here to receive quality diagnostics and therapy. The staff at the center worked with great dedication, and there was even a 24 hour nursing office. It was this medical center that William considered his main brainchild, because he knew that his clinic was making a great contribution to the health of the people of his native land, as well as to the restoration of social justice. Newspaper spreads were once again full of eloquent headlines. A Cuban businessman organized a medical center for social justice. The businessman decided to develop another market segment. Man does not live by bread alone. The new medical center provides free assistance to all comers. Detractors perceived another success of the entrepreneur as a personal failure. Alex heard the news. I've already offered my condolences. Williams had his piece of the pie again. For so many years, there's been virtually no competition in this sector. What's the world coming to? Yeah, Jack. Word on the street is that even longtime regulars at Mike's clinic are secretly visiting Williams Center. There's no respect left. If this keeps up, we're going to get pushed out of the way. We need to do something about this. Before it's too late. It's a matter that Mike and I need to think about together. He's the first priority, so he's not going to say no. And while his enemies were figuring out how to get rid of William, William was reaching new heights. Already by the age of 40, William had become a regional symbol of success and caring for others. His example inspired many people and showed that it is possible to achieve incredible heights if you confidently go to the intended goal. In fact, the secret to William's success was that there were no secrets. He was just a very purposeful person, knew exactly what he wanted from this life, and did not wait for water to run under a lying stone and care for others was instilled in him by his grandmother. From early childhood, he invested in his future, studied hard, got good grades, developed leadership skills, and always tried to be the best at what he did. Even his grandmother marveled at the diligence in her grandson. William, when you have time for everything, even I don't get up so early and go to bed late too. You can get sick that way. Grandma, you told me yourself, God blesses the early riser and I'll get enough sleep in my old age. What's there to lie around for? To rest my legs. No one will do my work for me. And I have so much I need to do better. I sleep less now, 
but then I'll be able to take my time when I've accomplished everything I've planned, and whatever it is you have planned for yourself. I will definitely become a very rich and respected person, and for that I need to study and work hard. We don't have anyone to help us, so I'll have to do everything on my own. You're so young, you're already thinking like an adult. But God help you, grandson. With God's help, you'll do anything. When William grew up, he started working for a large company and quickly moved up the career ladder. He was a responsible and hard-working employee, striving to achieve his goals. However, William was not limited to his work. At the peak of his career, he realized that, working for someone else's uncle, he would not be able to achieve all the planned goals in a short time. This is how his first business idea was born. I'm sorry, but I have to resign. I shocked my boss one day. William, are you out of your mind? His boss jumped up and down in his chair. You're a top manager. You don't just quit that job willingly. Did the competition poach you? Did the headhunters get to you? How much did they offer you? I'll give you double. Calm down. I'm not being poached. I'm leaving on my own initiative. I've decided to start my own business. Being an employee has become too crampid for me. I've outgrown it. It's not my style. William, if everyone could successfully start a business from scratch, we would be surrounded by Rockefellers and Rothschilds. But that didn't happen in the early days of entrepreneurship or now, a thousand years later. Do you really think you are better than the many who have failed in commerce or the majority who are struggling to stay afloat? And are you willing to sacrifice your career achievements? Is the ghostly chance of becoming a rare exception to the rule? It's better to try and regret than to regret never having tried. I've already made up my mind. Don't talk me out of it. It's pointless and useless. Look, you can lose your job in two minutes, but I won't take you back to the same position, with the same terms of payment. That'll teach you a lesson. So my advice to you is, don't get too excited, think about it till tomorrow. The morning is the morning. You don't want to take it out on your shoulders, and you don't want to cut the limb you're sitting on. It's not wise. There's plenty of time to think things over before morning. You'll never get an offer this good again. I'm offering you double pay. Just think about the numbers. Thank you, of course, for such a generous offer, but I've already made my decision. Please don't change your mind and give me your blessing for a new job. If I've wronged you, I'm sorry, but don't try to hold me back. I will leave with or without your blessing. And so began William's rise as an entrepreneur. And within a year, William was already taking his first confident steps into entrepreneurship. He never acted on a whim, always carefully analyzed the market, its dynamics and trends. A couple of years later, businessman William became the talk of the town. Representatives of local and regional authorities often invited William to various events, including the awarding of another favorable letter or diploma. Hello, William. Olivia, head of the City Department of Labor and Social Development, is here to see you. At the end of this month, we will be honoring outstanding members of our city for their services in the social and economic sphere. We'd like to invite you as both a successful businessman and philanthropist. You have become a laureate of the award of the head of the city administration and are recognized in the nomination for a significant contribution to the creation of conditions for the all-round development of people with disabilities in the field of trade. Will it be convenient for you to visit our event organized in the House of Culture at 15 o'clock on the 30th day? Hello? And what day of the week will it be? It's Saturday. On the last Saturday of this month, I have not planned anything yet, so I will be able to attend your event. Thank you for the invitation. We look forward to seeing you. There will be representatives from several charities there. They have a surprise for you, so a lot of people would like to see you there. I'll try to be there. I can't make any promises because plans can change at the last minute. Things happen in a company, and if my personal presence is not urgently needed anywhere, I'll be there by 15 o'clock. William tried as much as possible to pay attention to all organizations and institutions that invited him to some socially important events. Although he himself did not like to publicize his participation in charity because he believed that one should do good in silence without expecting publicity. However, due to his natural tact, he could not refuse people inviting him. And so it was this time. Despite his social importance and material prosperity, William did not boast of his status. He was open and simple in communication. In everyday life, this man was also very modest and unpretentious. Knew the value of money, so did not spend it on image, expensive things, 
and did not seek ostentatious luxury. William, of course, realized that money is an important aspect of modern life, but did not consider it a top priority. Many of William's friends and acquaintances, who were driving around the city streets in expensive sports cars, did not understand him, and periodically asked him, William, who would say that you are a successful businessman who owns an entire holding company? If we didn't know you, we would never have thought that you had any money at all. Sometimes you're a sight for sore eyes. It's not about money, Nicholas. It's not the money, I agree. It's the amount of money. We're talking about different things. I don't measure happiness in terms of quantity, and the quality of happiness for me is not associated with any material goods. Everything material is a temporary phenomenon. It is just a means of existence of activity, i.e. auxiliary tools. But people can live in various conditions, including without the benefits of modern civilization at all. Have you ever heard of localized tribes, non-contact peoples? What tribes? We live in the 21st century. All the tribes have remained in primitive society. Wrong, my friend. These are peoples who have no contact with the outside world and modern civilization. Today, of course, there are few such peoples left, but they still exist in parallel with us. Information about them comes mainly from the stories of their neighboring peoples or, for example, on the basis of analysis of aerial photographs. But let's say that these pygmies live on some godforsaken island. And then what? What does that have to do with us? What were we talking about? Why are you changing the subject? These peoples have everything to do with what I'm trying to explain to you. They have no connection to modern civilization. That is, they have no cars, no televisions, no appliances, no smartphones or landlines. But they still live, breed and multiply, develop in their own way. This is their local world, and they do not cease to exist in isolation from the modern civilization so dear to you. I still don't understand what this has to do with it. What do we care about their desire not to communicate with the civilized world? Their existence proves that the importance of things and benefits of civilization is overrated. You can have none of it. One can literally cover oneself with a fig leaf and be happy. A person just needs to maintain his physical existence, for which water and food are necessary but not restaurant dishes, for that is gluttony but just any sources of calories and useful microelements to maintain energy and vitamin-mineral balance. That's why I don't care what I fill my stomach with. And certainly I will not go to the most fashionable restaurant for the sake of it. Because except for Ponce, such a desire logically cannot be explained by anything else. What dignity? Don't you realize that food from an expensive restaurant will be completely different than in a cheap eatery? In the latter case, you risk catching some kind of disease. There are rats and cockroaches walking the tables, and I wouldn't be surprised if they are also the secret ingredients of a good half of the dishes cooked there. Man, like any animal, can adapt and survive in any conditions, including extreme ones. If you strive for constant sterility, then of course your immune system will not develop, and any new microbe will be a disaster for you. And I grew up on the street, ate unwashed vegetables directly from the bed, and berries directly from the bushes plucked rather than take them on the shelves in stores. And as you can see, I'm still alive. And if you are used to everything subjected to thermal pretreatment, then, of course, you better not to experiment with unwashed vegetables. But it is one thing to choose between washed and unwashed fruit, and quite another to believe that the usefulness of a dish is determined by the status and expensive service of the canteen where it was prepared. Thus, businessman William was a shining example of how one can be rich and successful, but live modestly and care for others, and still find time for his hobbies. His life clearly demonstrated that wealth is not an end in itself, but should be for the good of society as a whole. But not everyone shared his philosophy of life. Longtime friend Boris, for example, often asked him, William, well, what was the point of earning so much money, if you do not really use it? Why don't I use it? My money is working for the good of my business and my community. Okay. Investing in the development of your business, investments and passive income, I understand that. But just giving away money that you don't get easily is beyond me. I, brother, am also not the first year in entrepreneurship and was not born yesterday. So I know the rules of business and the laws of the stone jungle. You think you're doing anyone any good with your charity work? You're doing them a real bare favor. Justify it. You ever hear the parable of the wise man and the fisherman? No. I don't recall. That's the thing. You probably don't know it. Well, 
Listen to it. On the outskirts of a fishing village, there lived a wise man. One day a fisherman from the same village came to him and asked him for some fish, because the people in the village were starving. The wise man refused to give him the fish he had caught. The fisherman was surprised, saying that it was a lot for one, but it was enough for the people to satisfy their hunger. The wise man then explained that he would not give him the fish, but he would give him the rod. And the moral of this parable is that if a man is given a fish, he will be fed only one day. And if you give him a fishing rod, he'll be fed for a lifetime. Now use your associative thinking. See where I'm going with this. I do. But I don't agree that this parable applies to me. I don't help able-bodied adults who can support themselves. I help only those who really need it, the elderly, the disabled, children from large and disadvantaged families, orphans. I don't give them all just money because, for example, parents can spend it on themselves or some common family needs, and the child will get nothing at all. That is why I immediately buy what the child needs. If the parents in a large family cannot find a job and therefore their family is poor, I help them find a normal job. So, in essence, I give people the same fishing rods, not just fish. But even so, you're still giving a lot of money that could be working for you and benefiting you. That money does benefit me as it is. I see happy eyes of children and old people. I hear words of gratitude when I meet them. And for me, this is the best indicator that my money really works and benefits me. And not only for me, but also for society. And isn't this the meaning of human existence? If one person can do something better than another and is able to quickly earn a lot of money, it does not mean that he should be engaged in constant accumulation and get even richer. Where to put this money? Is it in jars or something? In jars, but not glass jars, but Swiss jars, like all normal people. But normality is also a rather abstract and subjective concept. What is normal for one person may be a complete game for another. It's not for nothing that they say that what's good for the Russian is death for the German. Come on, William. There's no use talking to you about these things. You'll come up with a million excuses and justifications for your reckless attitude to money. Boris, why are you counting my money? I don't borrow it from you. I earn it myself. So maybe I should know how to manage my own finances. And let's just get this over with. Honestly, I'm sick of it. It's the same thing every month. William had similar conversations with many businessmen he knew. And, despite the fact that many did not share his views, he still remained in his opinion. In his free time, William practiced sports, was fond of mountaineering, and often went to the mountains. Every year he steadily went on new hikes because he not only loved nature and enjoyed the beauty of mountain scenery, but also believed that such an active vacation helps him to stay healthy and energized for work. He usually woke up early in the morning getting ready to go on a new mountain hike. In the hustle and bustle of the city, he missed the feeling of freedom that comes from climbing mountains. William packed his things on automatic, taking with him everything he needed. Tent, sleeping bag, food, water, and mountaineering equipment. Most of the time he went with a group of familiar climbers, but sometimes he made solo ascents. He climbed along mountain trails, enjoying the beauty of the surrounding nature, seeing green forests, mountain rivers, lakes, and majestic peaks shrouded in a blue haze. William felt a part of this nature and enjoyed every moment of his journey. William spent several days in the mountains, overcame many obstacles, and tried to reach the top of one of the mountains. When he returned home, he felt full of energy and ready for new challenges. Mountaineering was a real outlet for William. It was in the mountains that he felt completely detached from the hustle and bustle of life, administrative business decisions and other daily routine. And his friends even here found a reason for bewilderment. I don't understand you, why you are always drawn to some extreme adventures. If you lack adrenaline, you could take part in street racing with me. That's where the adrenaline kicks in. Boris, I don't go to the mountains for adrenaline. Words can't explain it. Instead of hearing a thousand words, it's better to see it once. Come with me at least once. We'll start at the beginner's level. I promise I won't take you on any difficult trails. There's a lot I haven't seen. Mountains are mountains. If I need to get to the mountains, I will watch some thematic TV program or bloggers' reviews. I don't need to climb mountains myself. But then you'll never understand what I'm feeling. You have to feel it on your own skin. To inhale full-breasted, rarefied mountain air. To feel how the wind ponders your face to hear how the grass and tree leaves rustle, to see how nature wakes up and falls asleep. 
on the mountain slopes to meet the sunrises and sunsets in the mountain valley. I didn't know you were such a romantic, Boris laughed, and William was once again convinced that, apart from common interests in business, he had nothing in common with his acquaintances. On one of the hikes in the mountains, William met a girl named Mia. She was a truly extraordinary person, and not just another smarmy face which he met, already hundreds on his way. She was the living embodiment of a poet's or an artist's dream, and William immediately felt sympathy for her. Her hair was the color of gold. The sun seemed to shed its rays on it. It flowed over her shoulders like waves and shimmered in the light of day. Mia's eyes were as deep and blue as the ocean. They looked at the world with such wisdom and love that he couldn't take his eyes off them. Once William looked into them, he realized that it was a blue pool to drown in. Her smile was sincere and warm. When the girl smiled at him, William felt his heart flutter. She was like an angel who came down from heaven to give people true love. Mia wasn't just beautiful, she was wonderful. Her beauty was not only external, but also internal. She was intelligent, educated, kind and caring. Mia was one of the few people who could make his heart beat faster and his soul tremble with incomprehensible excitement. William couldn't believe that such a beautiful woman could exist in reality. He felt as if she had been created just for him, to brighten his lonely existence. He approached her and spoke. His voice was unusually quiet and occasionally broke from excitement. Hi, my name is William. And you are? Hi, I'm Mia. Nice to meet you, William. Nice to meet you, Mia. Do you often go camping? No, to be honest, it's the first time I've ever done it. It was kind of scary before, but my friend talked me into it. They've been hiking with a group a few times. She loved it. And now she's decided to introduce me to the beauty, too. Do you often go on such trips? I've been going both in a group and alone for a long time. Now I understand why I've never seen you in a group hike before. How lucky I am that you decided to join this particular group. I mean, we could have missed each other and never met. What an interesting twist of fate, don't you think? Well, the earth is round. Maybe we would have met someday. If it was meant to be. Do you believe in God or fate? I can't call myself a true believer, but I won't completely deny the possibility of the existence of some higher powers. Is it God or just some intelligent substance? No one knows. If scientists still have not come to a single opinion on this matter, then how can I, a mere mortal, know the exact answer to this question I can only assume? That's an interesting way of putting it. It's the first time I've heard such an original version. And I, believe me, communicated with a large number of people including scientists and public figures. What do you think of the hike itself? Do you share your friend's enthusiasm? I never thought it would be possible to have a wonderful vacation. Climbing the mountains. It's a very majestic view and very peaceful. I've never experienced anything like it anywhere else. Words cannot convey it. It is necessary only to see for yourself and feel with all your gut. There's no other way. Amazingly, this is exactly what I tried to explain recently to one of my acquaintances, who could not understand why I like mountain hiking. You just repeated what I said. Well, it turns out we have similar thoughts. You just intrigued me. I thought I'd never meet anyone who was like-minded on this issue. Well, except for those who've been climbing for a long time, if you don't mind. May I suggest we take a little walk together? I really like you a lot. Your reasoning is so close to me and at the same time unusual because I have never heard it from anyone before. It is as if you are voicing my own thoughts, although I have certainly not shared them with you before. And it is unlikely that we have common acquaintances who could tell you about my conclusions. I'm sorry, am I being intrusive? Perhaps my company is a burden to you. Don't be shy. Speak up. I'll understand. That you're not the least bit embarrassed. It was nice to talk to like-minded people too, especially since I don't know anyone here except my friends. And she seems to have found new friends and left me in proud loneliness. So I'll answer your offer to go for a walk together. Why not? From that point on in the hike, William spent a lot of time with Mia and they became good buddies. He learned that Mia participates as a volunteer in various social projects. So during their breaks, they discussed the different projects they were involved in and shared their experiences. Mia. What projects have you been involved in recently? Maybe we have crossed paths before, 
but for some reason we didn't notice each other until now. The last time I participated in an environmental project Clean City, do you remember that? Of course I do. Volunteers collected garbage on the streets of our neighborhood, but I only sponsored the events. Unfortunately, I couldn't participate personally because there were several other projects in the works. Yes, there was a lot of trash, but I think our labor was in vain because after a month there were unauthorized garbage dumps on the streets again. Just cleaning up after everyone who doesn't follow basic rules is pointless. I think we need a different approach here, and a systematic one at that. A one-off action will not help here. I agree. I also think that for people to appreciate cleanliness more, one project is not enough. It is necessary to conduct educational work, to introduce administrative measures, fines for non-compliance with the cleanliness regime. Yes, I think I agree with you. We cannot do without fines in this matter. Unfortunately, the mentality of the population is such that it is necessary to use both carrot and stick skillfully. It does not work any other way. And the love for cleanliness and order should be instilled from childhood, and even from kindergarten, so that the child immediately laid the right idea about the world around and the need to take care of our common home, the planet Earth. Where else have you been involved? A couple of months ago we held a charity event Help Your Neighbor. I remember exactly that volunteers collected clothes and food for the homeless. That's right. Uh-huh. I was very happy that so many people responded to our request for help. Yeah, that's great. I think projects like this are very important for the community. I totally agree. What are your plans for the future? I would like to continue participating in social projects in the future. I can't even imagine my life without active participation in society. It seems to me that this is my karmic mission. If I have time and opportunities, why not use them for the benefit of society? Don't you think I'm talking nonsense? Just many of my acquaintances do not understand me, and I even became embarrassed to voice such thoughts aloud. On the contrary, you are voicing my thoughts, and I am once again amazed at how similar we are. It's like I'm looking in a mirror right now. Just a reflection a little different externally, but your inner world is identical to mine, and that's just amazing. Mia, you're a very interesting person. In all my life I've never met a woman whose principles of life are so similar to mine. By the end of the hike, William realized that Mia was the first woman since his ex-wife with whom he could spend the rest of his life, but a bad relationship experience had discouraged him from committing himself to the bonds of marriage. William decided to load himself as much as possible with business and social work to distract himself from thoughts of Mia. However, the meeting with this girl did not get out of his head. He often remembered her and thought that now he missed the evenings they had spent so well together. But William was afraid to start a new serious relationship. He had already gotten used to his loneliness and his short, non-committal romances. And with Mia he wanted something more, but he could not afford such a luxury. William occasionally recalled how they spent all their free time together with Mia, meeting sunrises and sunsets and talking about life. Mia, you and I have discussed so many things, but I never cease to marvel at your wisdom. I'm glad to hear that. I'm also very interested in talking to you and I'm very happy to meet you. What do you want to talk about today? I have an idea for discussion. What do you think about the meaning of life? That's an interesting question. Personally, I think everyone has their own meaning in life. I agree. I think the meaning of life is the search for happiness and personal fulfillment. And how do you define happiness? For me personally, happiness is a state of mind when you feel full of energy and inspiration. It can be related to accomplishing a goal, caring for loved ones or strangers, or just enjoying the moment. That sounds wonderful. But what about the meaning of being? Well, that's a difficult question. Some people believe in God or a higher power that gives meaning to our existence. Others believe that meaning is about leaving a mark on the earth or making the world a better place. Yes, I too think it is important to do good and help other people. It can bring fulfillment and give meaning to our lives. Absolutely agree. Ultimately, everyone chooses their own path and determines their own meaning of being. William felt that Mia was his other half, his soulmate. William believed that some people were made specifically for each other, to be together forever. But to find the right soulmate, many people have to spend a lifetime doing it. William left, but his heart stayed with her. He knew she was the one who would change his life forever, 
but he wasn't ready for it. They exchanged phone numbers and called each other periodically. Hey, what's up? Hey, William. I'm good, thanks. How about you? Oh, I'm doing great too. I haven't seen you in a while. What have you been doing all this time? I've been busy with work, personal projects. And you? Same thing. A lot of work on various projects. By the way, have you heard about our new social project, Green City? No, I haven't. Tell me more about it. Of course, Green City is a project aimed at greening the city and improving the environmental situation. We want to plant more trees and shrubs, create new parks and squares, and improve the waste recycling system. That sounds interesting. What are the results already? But so far we are just starting to work on the project. We have gathered a team of volunteers who will plant trees and shrubs. We are also negotiating with local authorities to allocate land for new parks and squares. That's great. I'd like to join your team. That's great. We need people who want to make their city better. What role would you like to fulfill? I can help organize events related to the project or work with the public. Okay, I'll pass your information on to the project coordinator. He'll be in touch. Uh, thank you. Nice talking to you. See you later? Yeah, see you later. William was in no hurry to get too close to the girl he liked, because he had a bad history with the woman he wanted to marry. Fifteen years ago he had met Alice, a gorgeous long-legged blonde with model looks. He fell madly in love with her and married her immediately. Alice seemed to him just the perfect woman. She was beautiful, intelligent, charming, very elegant, and always looked impeccable. It was a well-educated girl who could support a conversation on any topic. But to William's great disappointment, the range of his wife's interests was very limited. Their daily conversations at the dinner table usually boiled down to the following. Listen, I've learned about new trends in fashion, and I wanted to share them with you. Well, tell me about it, if I refuse to listen. We'll either have a fight, or you'll just ignore the refusal and tell me about your super-duper popular new fashion items anyway. That's what you do all the time. You say yes and then you add something that makes me lose all desire to talk to you. All right, don't pout like a mouse on grits. Tell me about it. About your new products. I'm listening intently. Well, first of all, now very popular bright colors, especially neon shades. Ooh. I have already imagined how you will walk around the house, shining like a neon sign. As I understand it, you should definitely add neon to your closet. You're exaggerating again, but you're right about one thing. Of course I have to have neon in my closet. You're a famous businessman, a public figure, and I'm your wife. I'm the one who shows the rest of the world your status. People look at me and they see you. I'm like your walking business card so I have to keep up with the current trends. But if you look at it from that angle, you're right, of course. Of course I'm right. In case you haven't noticed, I'm always right, even if you don't notice it at first. So, another trend is the use of prints, especially animal prints and geometric prints. Sounds sexy. What's your favorite print? Will you be my panther or my tiger? That's where you hit it right on the head. I like animal prints especially leopard. It always looks luxurious and attractive, and I prefer geometric prints. They help create a modern, stylish look. Let the animals keep their animal colors. They were given them by nature for a reason. It allows them to remain unnoticed and successfully hide from predators or, on the contrary, sit in ambush, waiting for a gaping prey. What are you going to do in a leopard dress? What are you going to hunt? Another crocodile handbag at the boutique? William, you're an insufferable bore. How can you ruin my mood in five minutes? I'm just trying to make small talk. You're the one who wanted it, and now you resent it. Keep talking, like spaceships sailing around the Bolshoi Theater. What spaceships? What's the Grand Theater got to do with it? Never mind. Tell me about your fashion trends. Another trend is bulky things. For example, voluminous sweaters, jackets, and dresses. It turns out the sweatshirt is a trend. I like this trend already. Put on a work sweatshirt and you have a ready-made stylish look. Oh my God, why am I being punished like this? What sweatshirt? What am I talking about? What are you talking to me about? You're just mocking me under the guise of making conversation. I'd much rather talk to the wall. At least she wouldn't make stupid jokes every time she spoke. How can you be so narrow-minded? I'm just amazed at you. Don't you want to broaden your horizons? 
I'm the one who's limited. So you really think I need to know about fashion? And if I do not understand the annually changing and very abstract and subjective fashion trends, there will be a disaster. I suppose that my unwillingness to educate on the subject could trigger the end of the world. Then, of course, I urgently need to go to some new fashion coaching to a promoted guru from the world of fashion. I don't want to be responsible for the apocalypse and its aftermath. I mean, come on. What a disaster. Why didn't you warn me earlier that the fate of the world depends on me? Such things should be warned in advance. Oh, come on. You're such a clown. It's impossible to talk to you seriously about anything. Alice pouted her already puffy lips and wiggled her chiseled nose proudly and went wiggling her hips to her bedroom. Sure enough, in a few minutes William followed her. He reconciled with his wife, promising to buy her all the prints and non-prints she needed. Except for minor disagreements over fashion, the first two years of their marriage had been heaven on earth. William seemed to fly on the wings of love. After a while, however, he began to notice strange things. Alice was often late for various events and sometimes did not come home at all on the pretext of spending the night at a friend's house. She became secretive, withdrawn. Her husband began to suspect that something was wrong. And one day, following Alice, he saw her meeting his driver. They hugged and kissed in the car right in the parking lot and were not the least bit shy of passers-by. William was shocked and couldn't believe his eyes. A fit of jealousy just swept over him. He ran to the car in a rage and began to pound on the windshield, shouting all the swear words he knew about his wife and her lover. Alice, as if nothing had happened, got out of the car, adjusting her dress right in front of her furious husband. Alice, how could you do this to me? And to who? My driver, right under my nose. William, I know you're shocked, but I'm glad you found out. I'm tired of hiding my feelings. You realize you ruined our marriage. It's your fault. You don't have to blame me for everything now. You've been away from home all day. What am I supposed to do? Put up a barn door and wait for better times? Do you even hear what you're saying and who you're saying it to? It's my fault that you cheated on me. Don't you have an ounce of conscience? When did you get so shameless? Or have you always been like this? Only a fool blinded by love wouldn't notice. Think what you want. I don't care anymore. I'm not going to force you to marry me. Our relationship is already over. So what's the point of living a lie? The only thing I can offer you is an open relationship. Psychologists call it an open marriage. Are you out of your mind? Do you realize what you're offering me? You're an immoral person. I'm disgusted that I know you, not to mention the years I've wasted on you. I'm going to have to fumigate the whole house because there's no guarantee you haven't brought your men right into our marital bed. Honey, I know exactly what I'm saying. But I don't think you understand what I'm saying. I've been unfaithful to you for a long time. You're a wonderful man, but physically and energetically and psycho-emotionally I lack drive. Unfortunately, you can't give me that, so I've had to look for those feelings on the side. If you didn't feel that way about me, why did you marry me? Why didn't you tell me you were unhappy? What was the point of this farce? Called family? You're fine with me in every other way, and I thought the chemistry between us would come later. But I was wrong. Eventually, you started disappearing day and night, working on your next projects. I'm a young, temperamental woman with my own physiological needs. I need a man's attention here and now, not in the future, on a prearranged schedule. I wish you had never gotten in my way, he replied in a depressed voice. He was broken and disappointed. He couldn't believe that his perfect wife had turned out to be a cheater. It was a big blow to him and he decided to divorce her but his misadventures did not end there. During the divorce proceedings, Alice tried to squeeze out his business, which by that time had already begun to flourish. Only good lawyers' personal connections helped him then to avoid the barbaric division of the enterprise. However, even after the divorce of the ex-wife for a long time did not leave attempts to obtain from him a voluntary transfer of part of the business, resorting to various methods, up to threats and blackmail. Well, hubby, we meet again. Let's talk. I'm not your husband anymore. We had an annulment, and you were given a certificate to prove it. Or have you forgotten? I have a lot of things to do, and I don't even have a minute to spare for you. That's exactly what I wanted to talk to you about. Our business together. What business is that? Our business, which for some reason you think is just yours. I built it with my own hands. You had nothing to do with it. 
but I was your wife. You were, and now you're not anymore. But we had a prenuptial agreement that said in the event of a divorce we'd split everything in half, contract to contract. But there are laws. There in the last paragraph states that in the part not regulated by this contract apply the general rules of family and civil law, according to which everything that was acquired before marriage is the personal property of the one who acquired it, and I started the business before you and I were married. Plus, there was a restricted list of assets in the contract, and the business wasn't part of it anyway. But you developed it while we were married. I developed it with my own money that I made before we were married. You barely gave me anything. You put all your money into your stupid business. Do gifts only come in money? If you'd asked, I'd have given you a car or an apartment. But you never asked for anything. Everything was fine with you. Because I trusted you, I thought we were together. I thought we were together too. Until I found out it was just the three of us. But business is my own business. Besides, you violated the prenup, so you can't invoke it at all. If you were planning on claiming jointly acquired assets, you should have been involved in the formation of those assets. You probably didn't read that clause at all. So you lied to me? Not exactly. I didn't lie to you. I just didn't tell you the whole truth. But you can read. You could have consulted a lawyer about the contract when you signed it. You're such an asshole. You can insult me all you want. You're out of business. But no, I'm not going to let it go. I'll get a good lawyer, and we'll review the case. Go ahead. You're going to need lawyers. After the divorce, William decided to focus on his business and never enter into another long-term relationship. When he realized that there are no perfect people, everyone has their flaws and problematic character aspects. Alice made him build a psychological barrier that prevented him from getting close to women. It was as if he stayed all this time in some kind of icy armor, through which no one could not break through. However, meeting with Mia awakened in him the emotions that had been dormant all this time. Every now and then William saw the image of Mia, so bright and radiant, which seemed ephemeral, not an earthly creature, but William chased the stray thoughts away, burying deep, burgeoning seedlings of a new feeling. As much as William tried to hide his emotions, those around him were already beginning to notice the striking change. Listen, Nicholas, have you noticed anything strange about William? Yes, he's a strange man. That's why you can't keep track of all his oddities. What's the other thing that's been added? It seems our mutual acquaintance has fallen in love. Oh, come on, that's the news. He's been running from women like hell. Who could he be in love with? Unless it was an alien or a woman as blissful as himself? I don't know that for sure, but he's different. And how does that manifest itself? Does he glow in the dark? Stop kidding around. I'm telling you in all seriousness that he's changed a lot. He's distracted, he's cloudy, he smiles a lot, he stares at one point. It's really strange, especially for William. Are you sure it's love and not some disease? Maybe his flask is just whistling or something worse. Well, I'm no doctor, but I think it's at least a crush, if not love. Otherwise, there's nothing strange about him other than the usual. I'm curious. I'll have to keep an eye on him. Weirder than usual, William. It must be quite a sight. That's how William was discussed by his friends while he himself stubbornly ignored the feeling in his heart. But fate had it differently. A fateful event forced William to rethink his life and reconsider his priorities. On another hike, William almost died when he fell off a cliff. Doctors spent all night working on him, picking up his broken leg. It's the only thing he seriously injured in the fall. Other than that, he's just abrasions and bruises, plus a closed head injury. Even the paramedics themselves marveled at the patient's luck considering the height of the fall. William, you were born for the second time in our practice today. This is the first time that a man fell from such a height and got away with a couple of fractures, bruises, and a slight fright. Admit it. Do you have any special technique for falling properly? Can you, like a cat, land all the time on shock-absorbing pads? No. I just actively start waving my arms and thrusting my tail, William replied with a laugh. What kind of techniques could there be? It was just luck. There were a lot of bushes and I was clinging to them as I was falling. They slowed my speed and cushioned my fall. Well, saving a faller, like saving a drowning man, is up to the faller. Well, I guess you could say that. This time it was all right, but the incident seemed to have awakened William from a deep slumber. William had always been a man who lived life to the fullest, 
loved risk, adrenaline, and his life was full of adventure. Finding himself between life and death, he experienced a real shock and realized that he had lived before too careless and careless. And while he was debating the philosophical subject of existence, there were equally pressing questions being discussed across town. Sam, you said there'd be no misfires. What's that supposed to mean? Alex assured me that everything will be done in the best possible way. No misfires. I don't know what happened. I'm in a trance myself. You do realize that we paid a lot of money and got nothing. We got screwed. We were left with no results and no money. And that's doubly frustrating. Alex, you talk as if I order people around every day. It's not like we're living in the 90s. Nobody does that anymore. I told you this was a bad idea from the start. We should have sicked the IRS on him. Economic Security and Anti-Corruption Department. With a business like Williams, there's bound to be a catch. No, you just wanted to do it the old-fashioned way, didn't you? Well, there you go. You should be thankful that anyone was willing to go along with it. Obviously, they're amateurs, so they couldn't follow through. Or maybe it was just a coincidence. We weren't there, so we can't say for sure what happened. We'll have to find out more. But we have to do it as discreetly as possible, so we don't draw attention to ourselves. We don't want the cops on our tail. Then we'll end up getting trouble on our own dime. That William was born with his shirt off his back. I wouldn't be surprised if he's got nine lives like a cat. And now he's just used up one of them. All right then. What's done is done. We all need to lay low and stay low for a while. Tell the execs to do the same. Tell them to go someplace far away for a while. We can find out everything later. If we start sniffing around now, we'll attract attention. And then... When things quiet down, it'll be a lot easier to do it quietly. We got plenty of people we know in town. I agree. That's what we'll do. We don't need to make a move now. You only need haste when you're catching fleas. William did not even suspect that the broken rope was not a coincidence but an insidious, carefully thought-out plan of his competitors. What William did realize was that it was a blessing in disguise, but it was a blessing in disguise. He realized that he had not paid proper attention to his family and friends, and that his life guidelines were not quite right. He also realized that life was too short to spend it on things that were not satisfying. William decided that now he would start enjoying every moment of the here and now, because there might not be a tomorrow. The incident that almost cost him his life was a turning point for William. Therefore, after returning from the clinic, he decided to find Mia. For some reason, the phone they used to communicate with each other didn't answer. William began to look for the girl in social networks and through mutual friends, but they didn't know where she was. But William did not give up and kept searching. One day, browsing the internet, he came across a volunteer community in which Mia was an active participant. William was very happy about this find and immediately contacted her. Hi, Mia. It's been a while. How are you doing? Hi, William. It's good to hear from you. I'm fine. Thank you. How are you? I'm doing great. Thank you. It's good to hear from you, too. How did you get my new number? I just remembered I didn't tell you I changed it. Found you in the volunteer community. Remember that mountain hike we went on six months ago? You told me then that you were in the volunteer community? Yeah, of course I remember. It was great. We laughed so much, discussed so many issues. I don't think I've ever talked to anyone in my entire life as much as I did with you. On that camping trip, it was definitely a lot of fun. I think back to those days often, and you know, I realized that I missed hanging out with you. You got me hooked on our philosophical conversations, and I guess I developed an addiction to them. I tried looking for a substitute, but I couldn't find anything. I remembered our philosophical evenings, too. It was an unforgettable experience. I've never had anything like that with other men. They usually prefer not to talk to women about such things. But you surprised me. You talked to me as an equal. Not once did you even hint at sexism or social inequality. Thank you. I'm very glad to hear that. Listen, I've been meaning to ask you out. What do you say? Uh, I don't know. I'm on a really tight schedule right now. I'm busy with work and social programs. I'm still volunteering. It's a lot of work right now, too. I understand. Why don't we just meet somewhere for coffee? Where do you usually get it? You name any place and time. I'll drive up. Just please don't say no right away. Well, just give me the tiniest chance to see you again. 
I can't promise it'll work, but let's try. For example, Saturday morning, the coffee shop on the corner of Spring Street at 10 a.m. Would that work for you? Great, you got it. But I'll see you Saturday. Okay, Saturday. Saturday morning. William couldn't wait for the appointment. It seemed to him that time just stood still and the hands of the clock stopped moving. He couldn't take his eyes off the dial of his smartphone. Because of this, he didn't even notice how Mia approached his table. From the surprise, William did not even immediately realize that the girl he had been waiting for so long and impatiently had already come on a date with him. William? Hi. Are you okay? You seem kind of weird. Oh, I'm sorry. I was just thinking. Hey, have a seat. What kind of coffee do you want? Uh, whatever. Whatever you order for yourself, I'll have it. No, that's not good. What if you and I don't have the same tastes and you end up choking on bad coffee? Come on, tell me what you like and pick a dessert. Okay, I'll have a latte with maple syrup. I'll have a chocolate croissant for dessert. Good choice. I'll have an Americano and a brownie. Here's another point of intersection. Chocolate. I don't like sweet, sugary desserts. I prefer a little bitterness or sourness. What's your favorite? I don't like too sweet, but I don't like too bitter either. I prefer a balanced flavor. I can, for example, complement sweet with bitter or sour and get the flavor I'm looking for. Do you like to experiment with food? I guess so. I like to try new things. And food is no exception. And when it is always the same, there is always a risk that sooner or later you get bored of it. At least once in a while you need some variety, including in food. But I would not call myself a gourmet or a lover of food in principle. If it is necessary, I will do quite well and the minimum set of products. I'm not particularly fastidious, but you and I are similar in that. My friends don't understand why I don't go to expensive restaurants and prefer to eat at home or in average cafes. After Saturday's meeting, William was finally convinced of his feelings, and after a couple of dates, he asked Mia to go out with him. From that moment on, the young people spent a lot of time together. They walked around the city, attended various events, and just enjoyed each other's company. And everything would have been just fine, if not for one big but. Psychological problems, which later grew into complexes and phobia, greatly complicated William's personal life. He was always expecting a catch and could not get rid of the obsessive feeling of another incoming tragedy. Eventually, William decided to see a psychologist to cure himself of his fear of this new relationship. Hello? I would like to deal with my psychological problem. I can't cope with it myself. I've tried everything. Nothing helps. In the end, coming to you is a step of desperation. If you can't help me, I don't know what else to do. You're my only hope. Of course I'm listening. I'll help you in any way I can. But I need you to be as honest with me as possible. Just like in a confession, you tell it like it is, without hiding anything. On the degree of your sincerity depends on the final result. The more sincere you are, the higher the chance for a successful solution to the problem. I understand your point and will try to be as sincere as possible. The thing is that a few years ago I was married, as I thought, to the most beautiful woman in the world. But she cheated on me. And she did it cynically, right under my nose with my driver. Now I can't trust women. Ex-spouse as if repulsed me any desire to create a new strong relationship with the opposite sex. And now I met a very good girl, but I am very afraid that everything will go the same way. I constantly have a strange, unpleasant feeling, as if something bad is about to happen. And I can't get rid of these fears and worries. I'm torturing myself. I realize it's stupid, but I can't help it. It's beyond me. Maybe I have some real psychiatric problems. Yeah, it's really unpleasant. I understand how you feel, but it's important to remember that not everyone is the same. Everyone is unique. Everyone has their own psychological peculiarities that affect their perception of reality and behavior. Accordingly, you, your wife, and your new girlfriend are all completely different people. By and large, they have nothing to do with each other. Do you realize that? Yes, I realize that, but I can't help it. How can I start trusting a woman again? I haven't let anyone get close to me in a long time. I've only had fleeting, non-committal liaisons. And now I want to go to another phase, but I can't. I can't. And it's wearing me down even more. I can't even sleep well at night anymore. I have intrusive thoughts that keep me up all day long. And when I'm alone with myself it gets worse. 
hundreds of thoughts swarming like flies buzzing in my head, whispering nonsense. I try to brush them off, try to relax, abstract myself, but nothing helps. They only get quieter for a while, and then they come back and buzz even stronger. I think I'm going crazy, but the first step is to realize what's happened. And then you have to let go. You need to accept your feelings and experiences and realize that the problem is not in the new girl, but in your perception of reality. You are stuck on the old problem and constantly reliving it over and over again, instead of letting go and moving on. So what do I do about it? How do I get rid of intrusive thoughts if they keep haunting me? Let go. If you don't do it yourself, no one else can help you here. It's all in your head. You're the one transferring old scenarios to new relationships, even though they're completely different people, different situations and new surrounding circumstances. Stop measuring everyone by the same yardstick. Start, finally, to live with a clean slate, at least in terms of relationships with the opposite sex. A new relationship is a new chapter of your book. You're not going to carry over a storyline from an old chapter, are you? Well, I think I know what you're talking about. Thank you very much. The psychologist helped William realize that his fears were only related to one particular episode, which could not be projected onto the rest of his life and other relationships because they had nothing to do with each other. William began to work on himself and gradually got rid of his obsessions. He was happy and grateful to the psychologist for his help, because with his help he could finally realize that his fears were only an illusion, which he had been creating and nurturing all this time and now he had to kill the monster that his subconscious had created. Of course, the fear of loss could have deeper psychological roots. William had been raised and educated after the death of his parents by his grandmother Molly. He was the only child of her only son, and so the woman tried her best to replace both his parents, giving him all her unspent love without a trace. William was an intelligent and industrious boy. He helped his grandmother in the household, studied at school, and dreamed of becoming a successful and wealthy man. When he grew up, he went to the city to get an education and find a job. William was very grateful to his grandmother for everything she did for him. He realized that without her care and love, he would not have become the man he is now. The old woman refused to move to the city when her grandson became rich and stayed in her village. But William visited her monthly, bringing her food, medicine, household chemicals, Hi, the best grandma in the world. How are you? Hello, grandson. Thank you. I'm fine. How are you? I'm fine, too. I just came to visit. That's good. It's always good to see you. Have you changed your mind about moving to the city? I'm so lonely without you. Thank you, William. But no, I'm old. It would be hard for me to get used to the city. I'd rather stay here in the country. The air is cleaner here, and the people are kinder, less cars. And there's the TV shows that show what kind of things are going on. There's some terrible viruses going around, some other contagion. No, I feel safer here. And how can I leave my village where I've lived all my life? Who will I leave my cow to my breadwinner? And where will I leave my laying birds? I won't let them go under the knife. We'll live out our lives here somehow. All right, Granny. If that's the way you want it, I won't insist. William realized that his grandmother was old and it would be difficult for her to move out. So he decided that he would visit her regularly and help her around the house. Molly was immensely pleased with his visits and always looked forward to them. Several years passed like that. Vladislav continued to work in the city and grandmother lived in her village. They communicated regularly by phone and William was always interested in her health and needs. This time, as usual, William decided to visit his old grandmother a wise woman who had been through a lot in her time and whom he loved very much. Grandma, hello? How are you, my old lady? asked the grandson who arrived with a pile of presents. I have news for you. Well, tell me. Probably, again, some kind of business idea? Or are you trying to help someone again? Don't you have enough to do? No, this time it has nothing to do with business or charity. It's a miracle. What kind of woods did someone die in? That you've decided to talk to me about something else for once? What's that got to do with anything? Oh, I met a girl. Thank goodness I've lived to see this hour. Who's a nice girl? When are you going to introduce us? Grandma, she's a nice girl. But after Alice, I'm afraid of a serious relationship. 
Alice seemed nice to me at first, too. You know how much I loved her. That's right, grandson. There's a reason they say if you get burned by milk, you'll blow on water. So you do. But that doesn't mean that water burns like milk. You should know the difference. You're a big boy. Yes, I realize that situations can be different, but I still can't get rid of my doubts and fears. William, there's a sure way to test your soulmate. Bring her to my village to stay for a while. I'll make the arrangements. And what is this method? And this, grandson, is a woman's secret. Molly smiled slyly. Your business is to bring your fiancé to me under some pretext, and then I'll take care of it myself. Grandma, you intrigue me. I don't quite know what you mean, but I'll try to fulfill your request. Can you please tell me in detail what you want me to do? Well, grandson, you know how to start a business. But when you bring your own girl to the village to her grandmother, you need help. You can't do it yourself. Tell her I've decided to get to know her better, but I can't come to your town. That's why I want you to bring her to my village to stay. I'm sure she'll like it here and we can get to know each other better. Grandma, I understand that you want to meet my girlfriend and realize your plan. But how am I supposed to do that? I can't just tell her I want to bring her to the village so you can get to know her. That sounds strange and suspicious. We're not close enough to her to have a family viewing. Well, grandson, you're a clever boy. Think of something. Maybe you could tell her you want to spend a weekend in the country to get away from the hustle and bustle of the city. And then when you get there, I can offer to let her stay for a few days so we can spend time together. Grandma, that sounds like a plan. I'll see what I can come up with. Talk to her. But I can't promise she'll say yes. Don't worry, grandson. I'm sure she will. You just have to try. I'll wait for you here. William left his grandmother's house thinking, but his grandmother had also given him a problem. If he told Mia about it, he could just blurt out, My grandmother wants to test you. And if he just says he wants to visit, what then? What if Mia says no? I mean, she doesn't even know my grandma. But we can bring her over, get to know her. But then what? And then a brilliant idea suddenly struck him. He'll say his grandmother needs help. And he started making up a story as he went along. And he called and excited Mia. Hi, honey. How are you? What are you doing this weekend? Hi. The usual. I haven't thought about the weekend yet. Why? Is there a suggestion? Mia, remember I told you about my grandma Molly who lives in the country? Yeah, I remember that. I've had a breakdown. Grandma's sick. She doesn't want strangers around. And I've got to go away on business. I don't have time to look for a suitable nurse. And grandma won't accept anyone. Maybe you'd be willing to help? William waited breathlessly for Mia's answer. It was a great way to learn more about her character. After all, a truly kind person would surely agree. But if I'm helping strangers, can't I help my own boyfriend and his family? Of course I can. Then I'll come get you Friday night. Okay? Yeah. Sure. Come on over. As promised, on Friday after work, William arrived at Mia's house. The girl was already waiting for him on the bench with her traveling bag. Nervously glancing at the clock, not stopping anywhere on the way, they immediately set off. The road was long and quite tiring. Mia stared out the window, thinking about what lay ahead. Finally, they arrived at the village. William stopped the car in front of a small house surrounded by a garden. The girl got out of the car and looked around. The place was quiet, peaceful. The air was fresh and clean. William opened the door and invited the girl inside. The house was cozy and warm. There were flowers in the kitchen and fresh-baked goods on the table. Soon Molly came out to join them. She was a gaunt old woman with eyes that were faded from time, but still lit up with joy at the sight of her grandson and his bride. The old woman was very happy to see them, and Mia, having met William's grandmother, willingly agreed to stay to look after her. William left with some anxiety in his heart, leaving the two of them alone, knowing full well that he would be worried sick. But he trusted his grandmother so he realized that Mia was in good hands. The girl got to know her grandmother better and quickly found a common language with her. Mia helped her around the house, cooked meals, took care of the garden and vegetable garden. Oh, daughter, I'm already tired with this vegetable garden. Tomatoes don't blush, cucumbers don't grow, onions are all in arrows. Yes, Molly, it's hard without a man's strength. Maybe William could help. What's the use of him? He'll come once a month, he'll sit on your head, and then he'll go away. He has no time, he's tired. 
I don't know what to do. My grandfather, God rest his soul, did everything himself. He didn't rely on anyone. What about him? It's all right, Molly, we'll manage. I can weed the beds now and we'll chop some firewood tonight to make it easier for you. You rest now. Thank you, my daughter. I wish someone would teach my William to work the same way, because he can't even mend a fence. The old woman was sincerely grateful to Mia for her help and care. A few days passed like that. The girl got used to her new life in the village and even liked this small corner of nature. She spent time with William's grandmother, walked around the neighborhood, enjoyed the charm of life in the countryside. Molly turned out to be an amazing woman. You couldn't put your finger in her mouth because she could pull her arm off up to her shoulder. She survived the war and Stalin's repressions, lost her husband in the camps, and lost her son. Only her grandson was the only one left. She remembered the first time she saw her grandson. It was forty years ago when the USSR was going through a period of stagnation. Molly had returned home from a trip to Belarus, and there waiting for her was a little orphaned boy, the son of her dead son. She couldn't believe that this tiny, defenseless creature was her grandson, and that the burden of responsibility for him now rested entirely on her shoulders. As time passed, Molly raised her grandson as her own son. She taught him everything she knew about cooking, washing, cleaning, told him how important it was to be an honest and kind person. But life wasn't always easy for them. Molly worked as a milkmaid in a collective farm, and after the collapse of the USSR, the enterprise was privatized and it passed into someone's enterprising hands. The Kolkhozis were reorganized and their lands were distributed among the new owners. In order to provide her grandson with everything he needed, the woman contracted a shuttle service. Together with a friend, they brought consumer goods from abroad, traveled to countries where they were in large quantities, at affordable prices, and then sold them safely at a speculative price. Lubov Ivanovna often recalled this part of her life when meeting with her former companions. Oh, May, do you remember how we were shuttle traders in the 90s? We were so busy back then. I remember bringing in clothes from China, Vietnam, Korea, Poland, Turkey. Yes, Molly, we did. We used to bring in everything from clothes, shoes, toys, and food. Nowadays the stores are full of everything, but back then we had to get everything ourselves. Do you remember when we went to China? What were the markets like there? I still remember the noise, the crowd of people, sellers shouting in all the languages of the world, but we made good money even then. I also remember traveling to Turkey. There were a lot of interesting goods there too, but the conditions were quite different. We had to live in a hotel with no facilities and eat what we bought ourselves. But we coped. Yes, it was difficult, but we survived. Now I look at these times with a smile and gratitude. Because thanks to this experience I learned a lot to be resourceful, enterprising, to find a way out of any situation. You are right. This experience was very useful for us in life. Now we can safely say we've been through fire, water, and copper pipes. That's right. What doesn't kill us makes us stronger. She tried not to show her grandson her fatigue and pain, but sometimes tears still came to her eyes. However, despite all the difficulties, Molly did not give up. She believed that her grandson would grow up to be a good man and would be proud of her. And after many years, Molly's grandson became a grown man. He is now a successful businessman, standing strong on his own two feet, and helping not only the city but the region as well. Molly was happy. She knew her life had not been in vain as she had raised a worthy man. William's grandmother's age was already a respectable eighty. But the old woman was still a good woman and went to the woods alone and did her chores. She and Mia went out early this morning to go into the woods. Come on, Mia, let's go berry picking. Come on, Molly. What kind of mushrooms are we going to pick? All sorts. The porcini is the most valuable mushroom you can get. And then there's aspen berries. Aspen berries, chanterelles, chanterelles. What kind of berries do you need? Anything that can be dried or used for compote and jam. And you won't get poisoned. Oh, what are those beautiful red berries? Those are wolf berries. It is not recommended to eat them. Poisonous. You shouldn't make jam from wolf berries, but local witch doctors use them to make potions. They say it can even cure cancer. Popular among us and tinctures from it ointments for rheumatism and skin diseases of all sorts. Why are they called wolf's bones? Who knows? Maybe because wolves eat them? Who knows? Or maybe it's because you should be as wary of these berries as you are of wolves. 
What are those mushrooms over there? They're currants. You can even eat them raw. Hence the name. And those green mushrooms over there are edible? No, they're grebes. You wouldn't call a good mushroom that. It's a word for it. What are those orange berries? I think I've seen one of those before. Of course you have. It's sea buckthorn, which is very tasty and healthy. It makes excellent jam. Wow. You can tell you're from the city. The women walked along the path enjoying the fresh air and bird song. In the forest they found several berry bushes on which ripe berries were already hanging. The old woman carefully picked them, putting them in her basket, and Mia looked around fascinated. In this way they spent some time. Grandma Molly picked berries and Mia helped her diligently. Molly couldn't even remember the last time she had been sick, but now, for the first time in years, she had to play sick to keep up her act. Oh, I've been feeling a bit sick. I don't know which doctor to go to. Everything hurts. I'm a bit of a wreck. Molly, what exactly are you in pain about? Maybe you need your blood pressure taken. Do you have a blood pressure monitor in the house? My girl, you can just call me Granny. That's the last time the chairman of our state farm called me that, when he told me off for low milk yields. When I remember, I shudder. His whiskers wiggle. His eyes glisten, sparkle and spit. He should be in a circus with tigers in the arena. How scary he was. Everyone was afraid of him. Terrible. And I'd see him wiggling his mustache. I'm laughing so hard. He'd shout with his feet and slam his fist on the table. Red as a tomato from anger. And I'm laughing harder than ever. You've had a fun life, I see. Yes, Mia, I've had a lot of good and bad in my life. But I can't complain about fate. I've got a grandson. I lost my son and daughter-in-law. But they gave me a grandson. A guy like that is worth a hundred others. I'm like a stone wall behind him. While he was small, I lifted him up, put him on his feet. As soon as his legs got stronger, he helped me. He was not afraid of any work. He took care of the cattle, cut the grass, dug the garden, and carried water from the distant well in buckets. I don't know what I did without William. Mia, who looked like a typical city girl, found it surprisingly easy to fit into the village life. Mia, how do you do it so well? It's like you didn't grow up in the city. Grandma, I grew up in a private house. Not in the country, of course, but in a provincial town, in a private neighborhood. So I won't faint at the sight of a cow or a pig. I love animals. We had our own backyard parents kept poultry and goats. The neighbors had a cow and piglets. But only on mushrooms berries we went rarely, so only mushrooms from fly agaric could distinguish. But you and I went to the forest a few times and I already understand edible mushrooms much better. So you're practically a country girl. I see how quickly you've learned the ways of the countryside. That's good. I can't stand these city dudes. All they have on their minds are clothes and cosmetics. They can't brew tea or boil borscht. You can't let them near a cow. They'll start yelling so much that the poor cow will lose milk out of fear. What a funny way to talk. You should be a comedian. Thank you for your kind words. But we're well fed here, Mia. How long have you known my William? He's never told me anything about you before, has he? No, Grandma. We've only been going out for a couple months. We met on a camping trip over a year ago but then we didn't see each other for a long time. Only in a social project. One day he asked me to participate, and about three months ago, William called me out of the blue and asked me to meet him. I liked him right away. I remembered him a lot, so I agreed to go out with him, and then it just sort of spiraled, spiraled. And now we've been dating for over two months. Does William tell you everything about himself? It's just he's had one big love story in his life, and it didn't end well. No, he didn't tell me about that. Well, that's a shame. So you don't know that he has three kids from a previous marriage, one of whom is disabled? No, I don't know about that. But now you will, my dear. Do you know what my grandson does? He told me he runs his own business. Something to do with trade. Some kind of store, I think. Yeah, it's a little grocery store, small. But William, unfortunately, will never be rich. It's the fate of our people. A long time ago a witch put a black curse on them. It all started with William's great-grandfather Oliver. He was a good man but he always lived in poverty. Oliver worked in a factory, but his salary was not enough even for the bare necessities. One day when great-grandfather was still young, he met a witch doctor. She was old, ugly, but had magical powers. Oliver asked her to help him become rich. 
The sorceress agreed to do it, but on the condition that she would put a curse on him, which would be passed on from generation to generation. Every descendant of his great-grandfather would live in poverty and would never become really rich. Oliver, not thinking long, agreed to this condition, and the curse was placed. From then on, all of great-grandpa's descendants lived in poverty and could never become rich. William is the last in the family. He works hard, but he still can't make a decent fortune. My grandson wants to be rich, but he knows it's impossible because of the curse. Granny Molly. William never told me he was in any kind of need. He doesn't look like a man in need. He doesn't look poor, but he helps the whole village. We have a lot of relatives. If you help everyone, you'll get a lot of money. So he gives away everything before he's even collected it. And he gives it away for free. Who's to ask for the debts? It's not like they're relatives. Our own people. We'll get even. That's the whole story. How often does he have to help everyone like that? Every single month he comes here. And all the time not empty-handed. Some need medicine, some need clothes or shoes, some need a new shovel, and some have a dead cow. He, my grandson, will go through the relatives, everyone has some need, he will write it down. And then the next month when he arrives, he brings everything on the list and distributes it. And he makes a new list for the next month. Well, we've been hanging around for a while. It's getting late. Let's go to bed. The morning is always wiser. Good night, said Mia. The news of three children and a crowd of dependents discouraged her a little. Early in the morning, Grandma Molly pretended to be sound asleep and listened carefully to what the guest would do, whether she would pack her things and leave or stay. After a while, the old woman heard Mia sneakingly dressing, and slowly, so as not to wake the sleeping, in her opinion, old woman, left the house. After waiting for a couple of hours, Grandma Molly, sighing, got out of bed to call her grandson. But when she looked around the house, she found Mia's things still there. Where had that girl gone? Grandma Molly thought, and began to do chores and prepare breakfast. An hour later, the missing girl returned with a big basket of mushrooms. Grandma Molly, I went to the woods to have some fun and pick some mushrooms. Wow, a whole basket full of mushrooms. It's been a long time since I've had such a catch. It's enough for salting and frying, and I'll put it out to dry. Don't worry, I'll pick some more for you if you need it. It's no problem for me. And you have mushroomy places here. The main thing is that you remember what I taught you. If a single poisonous mushroom gets in your food, it's over. So we're going to have to go through this basket with you. And I've already made breakfast, so wash your hands and come to the table. We'll deal with the mushrooms later. You can't work on an empty stomach. I don't need much persuasion. I'm hungry as a wolf. That's good. You're not on any diets. You don't starve yourself. I liked you right away. I can't say anything bad about you. But I screwed up Mia. Forgive me too, old woman. Why should I forgive you? Just my poor head. I decided to give you a test. I told you all sorts of things about my grandson to see how you'd react. And now when I saw that you were not embarrassed by the news, I felt ashamed. Maybe I offended a good girl for nothing, so forgive me, old woman. What can I take? Old or young, it's all the same. I've already guessed that there's fiction in your stories. I just didn't understand why you needed it. I thought maybe it was an old man's fancy. Grandmothers often make up stories about their grandchildren to show off to others. But why would they make up so much stuff? That's what didn't make sense to me. Mia, I was worried about my grandson. What if you're just another convenient husband hunter? Suck to him like a leech. Yes, all the blood and drink all the juices from him would squeeze out for her whim. Credits would force to formalize so that he could buy you various gifts. Expensive on three jobs would be employed to pay off debts. And then you'd throw away what's left. You would have trampled all his manly pride. I've only got one grandson left in the whole world. I love William very much and I'm not going to leave him because he's not rich. I don't need much. It's enough to have him around. We have common tastes, hobbies, and the same views on life. It's very frustrating for me, you know. I thought you were as sincere with me as I was with you. And here you're acting out and you're not sick at all, as I understand it. Mia, you don't understand everything. Look over there. Read for yourself. And if you still have any questions, then ask. I promise I'll answer honestly this time and not be sneaky. Having said this, Molly took out a newspaper that she had carefully kept for many years and handed it to her guest. There was a large article on the front page with the sonorous headline, Pride of Our Region. The shocked girl read the contents of the publication 
and began to realize that she didn't know much about her chosen one. Mia learned from the article that William was a successful businessman who had achieved great success in his field. He was a real pioneer and innovator, had many awards and achievements, and in addition, was an active participant in public life and engaged in charity. He opened a private clinic with a discount program, helped children from low-income families, and participated in various social projects. She also learned that he headed a whole holding company, not a small grocery store, as she had previously thought. Of course, Mia was shocked and delighted by what she learned about her chosen one. She realized that he was not just a handsome and charming man, but a man with a big heart and extraordinary abilities. But along with admiration, resentment crept into her soul. What else don't I know about William? Maybe he's really married and has seven men running around? Or is he an Arab sheik with a mountain of wives? No, William's not married anymore. Already? So he did have a wife? He did. What's there to hide? And children? No, that snake didn't bear him any children. God saved my grandson from such a litter. What kind of children could come from a snake? Only snakes, young men. Molly, how can you talk about children like that? Whoever had them would have been his children. And there's no such thing as a stranger's child. You've probably heard of that. People even adopt children from orphanages. And you're talking about great-grandchildren. The higher powers know better. If that snake could give birth to something normal, God would probably give her at least one child. In her situation, a child would be good for her. When she tried to strip my grandson naked, you don't know what kind of person his ex-wife was, and you're already defending her. I'm not defending anyone, I'm just marveling at the way you talk about unborn children deciding who can be born and who can't. Let's start with the fact that it's not in your competence. As fate would have it, so be it. You make a good point. But that's not what fate had in mind. They didn't have children because that woman was not to be expected to produce. And she didn't care about children when you're chasing other men. Who has time to think about children? Was she cheating on William? Cheating is an understatement. She gave him so many horns that he couldn't get through the doorway clinging to her. And who did she do it with? William's personal driver. William's driver. What a nightmare. And only the one he caught her with in person. And how many others there were before him. God knows how many. Not a woman of the devil like my William was tormented by. If you only knew and wriggled and blamed himself for not giving her something. That's why she did what she did. I thought if I'd paid more attention to her, Maybe it wouldn't have happened at all. My grandson was too naive. Then what happened? Then soup and a cat. William was very upset and couldn't believe that this was really happening to him. He thought his wife loved him, but it turned out that she was just using him to achieve her goals. But that wasn't all. After William found out about her affair, his wife decided to take the business away from him. She wanted to use his money and power to become rich and successful. William was in despair, did not know what to do, but fortunately he had friends who supported him in this difficult moment, helped him to survive this crisis and start a new life. Poor William. William is not poor, but very rich. That's why all the fish are clinging to him. They want to get at least a crumb off the table. That's why I had you checked out. I didn't want another leech sucking on him. Forgive me if I'm wrong, but he is. He's all I have left of my son. I don't have any other relatives, so don't be sorry. God will forgive, Mia replied and went to pack her things. The girl was choked with resentment. Of course, she realized that there was some truth in Molly's reasoning. But in almost a year of acquaintance and a few months of intimacy, had William never found out what kind of person she was? What is she doing here then? Before Molly could realize it. Mia quickly packed her things into a travel bag, hailed a cab, and left. Molly felt, for the first time in a long time, that she had miscalculated. Moaning and groaning, she searched for the cell phone her grandson had given her. She dialed William's number, barely recognizing the digits. Grandson, I think your grandmother messed up. Grandma, what happened? I did what I planned. But Mia figured out that I was lying to her. I had to tell her everything, and it ended up making things worse. She must have been hurt or angry. What did she do? Did she hurt you in some way? Was she mean to you? No, honestly, I'd rather she was rude. So what did she do? She packed up and left. How? When? Where did she go? How? 
She called a cab about 20 minutes ago and left. Why didn't you call me right away? I was looking for my cell phone. I couldn't remember where I put it. I don't use it every day. Okay, I'll see if I can find her. William dropped the incoming call and started dialing Mia's number. The operator answered with a message saying that the phone was switched off or out of range. William waited a couple of seconds and dialed again. Nothing changed. Then he decided to go to Mia's house and wait for her there. If she hadn't arrived yet, because theoretically in the past half hour, she wouldn't have time to get back from the village and drive to her house. Ten minutes later, William was already outside the entrance of her house, just in case he went up to her floor and rang the doorbell. When he listened, he heard no sign of anyone in the house, so he went downstairs and waited for the girl's return on the bench. But after an hour or three, no cab arrived at the door. Then William began to worry. What if something happened to her on the way? Maybe they had an accident or a flat tire. He thought about it and remembered that he had the phone number of the head of the traffic inspection department of the region. Having searched in the phone book of his smartphone, William dialed the right number. Hello, Tim. It's William for you. William, William, it's good to hear from you. It's been a while since you've called me. Likewise, I wasn't planning on keeping you busy, but I have a problem, and I'm afraid you're the only one who can help me with it. So what's your problem? Did you have an accident or something? Not me. Actually, I don't know yet. I was wondering if there's any way I could check the day's traffic reports. Any traffic accidents in the last four hours today? Well, if you need it bad enough, we'll find out. Nothing's too cheap for a good man. I'll get the information and get back to you. Okay? Cell phone rings. You'll be obliging me. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Well, I'll be in touch, he said, and waited for Tim's call back. The waiting time, as it turned out, was dragging on impossibly slowly. William couldn't stop being nervous and felt like he was on pins and needles. Finally, the long-awaited call came. Well, William... I report that there have been no traffic accidents in the last four hours. I hope you found the information helpful. Tim, thank you so much. I owe you one. On the one hand, he was relieved. At least he knew Mia hadn't been in an accident. But on the other hand, William didn't know where to look for her next, and after thinking for a while, he remembered the volunteer community. He decided to go there. Arriving at the place, William immediately went to the leadership of the organization. Hello, Peter. I'm William. We've worked together on several social projects. How do you do? As I remember, it's good to see you. To what do I owe this visit? Is there a new project planned? Not exactly. I'm interested in one of your employees. She's a part-time volunteer, participates in a lot of activities. Her name is Mia. She's a friend of mine, but she's been out of touch for some reason. She's not home either. I'm worried about her. Can you tell me the last time you saw her? Maybe talk to her on the phone today? Uh, Mia, good girl, activist. She stopped by today. We're in the middle of a new federal project. We need volunteers to help out another region. So she volunteered to go. What kind of project? Where and how did she go? Well, when she arrived, a busload of volunteers was leaving. She left with them. She had her bag with her. She must have prepared it beforehand. So where did you send her? What's the exact destination? The volunteer headquarters is in a different area. Do you want the coordinates or can you find it? Thank you. I'll use the navigator. Having hastily thanked the director, William flew out of the office and ran to the car, plotting the route on the navigator. William found out that if he drove at top speed on the highway, he would be there in 10 hours, and it would take him 13 and a half hours without stops and traffic jams. Before leaving, he decided to talk to his grandmother, and dialed her number. Grandma, I'm going to get Mia. She took off in a huff with the volunteers to another area. I have to find her there and explain everything. I'm calling you to let you know where I've gone. If someone will be looking for me there, in the countryside, maybe the connection is bad, so I will call you from there myself. Don't worry about me. William, it's all my fault. I'm an old fool. I thought I was a fool. I made a mess. And now you have to deal with it. Forgive my sinful soul for Christ's sake. I was out of my mind. Grandma, I don't hold a grudge against you. You're not a little kid yourself. You could have guessed that such tests can offend a person. Never mind. Okay, we'll talk later. I can't waste any more time. So, several hours wasted waiting for her outside the house until the connection. William dropped the call and pressed the pedal to the floor. 
Twelve hours later, William drove into the region. The only thing left to do was to find the cherished village. After wandering around the neighborhood, William decided to use the help of the locals. Having stopped the car on the side of the road, William went out to talk to the grandmothers selling pies and fruit along the highway. Grandma, how much are pies nowadays? Depends on what they're with, my dear. With cabbage 50, with potatoes 60, with potatoes and liver 70, with liver 80. Which one do you want? Take one at a time. Each kind is delicious. You won't regret it. And if I take them in bulk, will you give me a discount? Sure, handsome. Anything for you. How many pies you got left? Half a bag of each kind. That's about 10 pies in each bag. That makes 2,600. I'm paying 3,000. But besides the pies, you'll tell me how to get to the village. It's a deal. Why don't we have a deal? You don't look like a bourgeois. Why don't you tell me if you have to? You're probably looking for someone. Have you lost your fiancé? Grandma, you see how perceptive you are? I can't hide anything from you. I lost my fiancé. Ah, affairs of the heart. Look, so, drive along this road, then turn to the country road, there'll be a sign. From there you'll have to drive along the fields. If you get lost, ask the combine harvesters, they'll tell you where to go next. Thanks, Grandma. Don't forget the pies, lovers. You're flying, you can't feel the ground beneath your feet. That's right. I forgot about the pies. Thanks again. Have a good trip. God willing, you'll meet the one you love. You'll never be different again. Oh, Mother, I wish to God you could say that. With these words, William, overjoyed with the anticipation of the meeting, set off again. An hour later a village appeared on a hill behind the fields. As he entered it, he saw the village in its pristine beauty. He was welcomed by the gnarled wooden huts and hedges made of bangles and chickens running along the country road. Stopping the car near the largest building, which looked like a village council, he got out to stretch his legs and do some reconnaissance. Old men were sitting on a bench and vividly discussing some important issue. I'm telling you, Andrew's been stealing chickens. He hasn't worked for a year. He drinks vodka black and shit. He needs something to eat. So he steals the local chickens. Stefan, aren't you ashamed to talk bad about people? Do you have any proof? Did you catch him by the hand? I held a candle when he was pulling chickens at night. No one's a thief if he's not caught. Then who do you think does it? Anyone. We don't have many needy people in our village. Besides, why do you only think about people? Maybe it's wolves or foxes? There's a lot of them in the woods now. If dogs smelled wolves and foxes, they'd make such a ruckus that the whole village would be up in arms. But here it's peace and quiet. So these people are also our own, to whom the dogs are used to. So what do you suggest we do? We should put traps along the fences. Anyway, this thief goes around at night, and during the day he wouldn't steal a bird too conspicuously. And if he hurts his leg badly with a trap, he'll have no reason to climb into people's yards and steal other people's goods. If the police can't do anything, we'll catch the criminal ourselves. The police were renamed police a long time ago. They changed the name, but it's no use anyway. The police and the militia. At that moment, William came to the old people. Good evening. Can you tell me where the headquarters of your volunteer organization is? Evening. What volunteer organization? I don't remember anything like that in our village. I was told that the village will host the headquarters of the volunteer organization Good for All. They're coming here to help local volunteers. You haven't heard anything like that? No, I haven't. Uh, hold on. Some bus came by the village hall this morning. Maybe that's what they were? The volunteer is yours. Who can you ask for more information about this bus? Ask Chairman Carl. He's probably still there. Thank you, William thanked the old man and went to the building, which he had correctly identified as the village hall. He was met by a woman of indeterminate age, with bright makeup and a nasty, squeaky voice. She probably served as secretary and security guard. Who do you want? I'm here to see Carl. What's this about? Volunteer organization and social projects. Did you make an appointment? No. Then Carl can't see you today. It's the end of the day, and he only takes appointments. A girl at her own risk, William assumed. Understand. I've come from another region on an important matter. I don't have time to wait for the next appointment day. This is literally a matter of life and death. I urgently need to speak to the chairman. That's what everyone says. And then it turns out you've come to beg for money again. Or you want to sell me some nonsense. 
If the chairman of the village council starts accepting everyone without an appointment, then he won't be able to go home at all. Listen, I am a well-known businessman, philanthropist, and public figure, the owner of the holding Kuban Prestige, which includes, among other things, a chain of grocery stores and a medical center, Health of the Nation. If your chairman finds out later that you didn't let a potential investor in, I'm afraid you may lose your job. These words apparently pierced the armor of the stalwart secretary. She put the chairman on the speakerphone. Carl, you have a visitor here without an appointment. He insists on a personal meeting right now, says he's a prominent businessman. Shall I let him in? Can't this businessman wait until tomorrow? It's the end of the working day. He says he's here on some important matter. He can't wait. All right, let's see what's important. Coming through. Come in, said the secretary, already addressing William. William walked through a sodden door. Behind it was a typical office of a mid-level executive. A large conference table stood in the middle of the room. Perpendicular to it was the chairman's own desk. The walls were hung with portraits of the leadership of the country and the region, flags, coats of arms, and other paraphernalia. Carl was an almost round, balding man who could easily be in his late fifties or early sixties. The chairman stared at the guest with interest. Hello, and what is the question you came to see me about? Do you know that I have a working day until 18 o'clock? And now it's 10 minutes before that time. Hello. I won't take up too much of your time. The thing is that I sponsor a social program in which volunteers from different regions take part. The volunteers were supposed to come here today, but I missed them. I was told that their bus was coming to the village council. Could you please tell me where they went next? Where is your volunteer headquarters? This is the all-important question that couldn't wait until tomorrow? If you are a sponsor of this event, you should know better than I do where the organization you are sponsoring is located, or you don't check afterwards to see where your money goes. I'm working with our regional chapter, and I've already spoken to the head of the chapter. He told me that he sent our group of volunteers to your village, but no one knows the exact location of the volunteer headquarters. I'm not going to lie, there's a dear person in that group. She stopped contacting me and I need to make sure she's okay. But you should have just said so. Why go to all this trouble? We're not human. We understand some things, too. Why don't you go see Anne now? You've already met her. She's my assistant. Ask her to write you the address of the volunteer headquarters for the federal program. Tell her you're looking for a group. She will tell you everything, including the name of the guest house where they are staying. Let me tell you right away, they don't live in our village. We've only got one street here, so it's a bit of a stretch. Thank you very much. Sorry to bother you. It's all right, you're young. We used to be like that ourselves. Well, good luck with your search. William found himself back in the lobby, which was also the assistant chairman's workplace. Anne, Carl said you could give me the address of the volunteer headquarters for the federal program. I'm looking for a group of volunteers who recently came here. I also need the name of the guest house they're staying in. I knew you'd distract a busy man from his work for some nonsense. Let's not escalate the situation. Just text me the address and name you were asked for and I won't bother anyone else. I would have gone home a long time ago. And because of you I had to stay late, the woman grumbled, writing something down on a piece of paper. Here you go. I wrote down everything we had in the file cabinet. You'll find the rest. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. You can't put it in your pocket. You can't put it on your bread, Anne replied wryly, with a sly squint of her eyes. I get the hint. I'll make it up to you. On the way back, I promise to stop by with more tangible thanks. William did not reach the guest house until late in the afternoon. There was no point in looking for Mia at night, so he decided to check into a vacant room and continue his search in the morning. At six in the morning, William was already at the reception desk. Good morning. What can I do for you? Asked the receptionist on duty. Hello. I need to know if Mia's volunteer group checked into your guest house yesterday. This is confidential information. I can't give it to you unless you are a law enforcement officer. But at least just tell me if the volunteers checked in here yesterday. Why are you asking? The thing is, my girlfriend is supposed to be part of this group, but she hasn't been in touch for over 24 hours. I'm worried something might have happened to her. I came here to look for her. So I'm asking you to be a humanitarian and help me find my girlfriend to make sure she's okay. I understand completely. 
but if the girl is not your relative, including your wife, we can't give you any information about her. Where's the guarantee you're not making this up? Maybe she doesn't want to see you, that's why she doesn't contact you, and you're illegally stalking her. I can show you pictures of us together. I'm sorry, but pictures of us together don't tell us anything. There's a possibility that you two did have a relationship, and then you had a fight, and she doesn't want to see you anymore. We can't have our guests disturbed. You do realize she could be in some kind of trouble, and now we're just wasting time bickering instead of finding her. If you think that the girl is in trouble and does not contact you for a long time, I recommend that you contact the police. Write a missing persons report. Such a statement is obliged to accept in any police department, regardless of the place and age of the disappearance. It can be filed by any citizen, not necessarily a relative. But I guess that's what I'll have to do, William replied sadly. He was about to leave the guest house when he saw Mia standing on the stairs. William, what are you doing here? Mia, oh my God, thank God I found you. You're okay. Why aren't you answering your cell phone? I've been looking everywhere for you. I blocked that SIM card so you couldn't call me. Why were you looking for me? I haven't disappeared. I have my own life, my own business. That's what I'm doing. That's why I don't understand why you came here. Nobody asked you to. Mia, I know you're probably upset with me and my grandmother, but believe me, we didn't mean any harm. I never meant to hurt you. I'm just used to trusting my grandmother. She said she knew how to do the right thing, but I guess you didn't like it. Please forgive us. Who are you people to experiment on people? What am I? Some kind of guinea pig. Who gave you the right to test me? Maybe you're the one who's not right for me. You kept everything from me for some reason. Then you started telling me stories. What kind of reaction did you expect from me? That I'd be touched and throw myself on your neck? I don't want anything from you. Stay away from me. Mia, let me explain. I don't want to hear anything. What can you explain to me? That you thought I was after your money so you pretended to be a regular working man with a little store. Did your grandmother have some kind of spy game going on? She made up all kinds of stuff you can't put on your head. I thought she was sick and her head's not right in her old age so she's telling stories. Turns out she's just an old schemer who's a hundred years old and still at it. I never imagined an old person could be capable of such a thing. Look, there's no need to insult my grandmother. She didn't do anything bad to you, she was just trying for her grandson. I'm not defending her, but she's understandable. Why did I insult her? What do you call a person who came up with a cunning plan to test the potential bride of his grandson and put it into practice, pretending to be sick and noodles on the ears? I've chosen the most decent epithets I can think of. I'm sorry, we didn't go to the Institute for Noble Women. We're not trained in manners. She didn't do it out of spite. My grandmother's old school. Apparently, in her day, they used to hold some kind of bride previews. So she thought she'd test you, see your strengths and weaknesses. Well, you can't shoot her for that. It's not a crime. You must understand that. I don't owe anybody anything. I don't really give a damn what your relatives think of me. If I was going to marry, I'd marry you, not them. It's not for them to live with me, it's for you to live with me. So what does your grandmother have to do with my strengths and weaknesses? Are we living in ancient Russia? Ow. This is the 21st century. If you needed a girl who lives by patriarchal principles and old traditions, then you have clearly turned to the wrong place. In your village, let your grandmother look for a suitable bride, and she knows everyone there. So there's no need to check, she'll choose the right ones right away. Mia, enough already. Have we really hurt you that much? You're making a tragedy out of nothing. You've developed inferiority complexes and stopped trusting people. I've never given you any reason to doubt me. And if you don't trust me that much, what's the point of continuing our relationship? I completely agree with everything you say, and I even went to a psychologist to get rid of my complexes, and my hypersensitivity and my anxiety. Believe me, I've taken steps to get rid of my distrust. But understand me and you have lived for many years, constantly fearing a trick from women. I could not overnight take and begin to trust a stranger. I went through a lot to connect with you. You were the first woman after my divorce that I wanted to get close to. Remember, I was the one who found your cell phone a number, called you and asked you to meet. And then you decided to give me a test to make sure I wasn't wrong. Yeah, the test was unnecessary. But when my grandmother suggested it, her idea didn't seem so scary to me. There was a thread of logic in it. That's why I said yes. 
Mia. I want you to know that love can be very complicated and difficult, but you should not be afraid of difficulties. If you love someone, you have to fight for your love and not give up. Never forget that love is the most important thing in life. That's why I came here for you. If I didn't care about you, I wouldn't have come all this way to look for you. Mia, I'm sure I love you and I don't need anyone but you. Do you have absolutely nothing for me? If I didn't feel anything for you, you couldn't hurt me. Only people you care about and close to you can hurt you. Mia, will you be my wife? I don't want to be apart from you for one more minute. Every breath I take without you is hard to take. I'm very sick, and only you can put me out of my misery or condemn me to eternal death. You're not going to give me any more tests, are you? Or is there some other quest I have to go on after the wedding? Mia, come on. Let's just forget about this stupid test thing. I'll apologize to you a thousand times if you promise to forgive me and forget this story once and for all. I can't promise to forget right away, because the memory is still fresh. And I won't remind you unless you remember or do something like that again. It's a deal. Now pack your things. We're leaving. We've got a few more stops to make. The next day William and Mia went to Molly's again. The old woman was over the moon when she saw them together, and from the doorstep she started wailing. Mia. I'm sorry. I'm an old fool. Don't be mad at me. Grandma, William and I have already talked it over. You have nothing to apologize to me for. What happened is over. Let's forget about it as an unfortunate incident. Grandma, I proposed to Mia, but she won't accept without your blessing. That's what we're here for. My children. I'm so happy for you. Of course I bless you for marriage because even a blind man can see that there's no way without a wedding. Love and advice. Live together. Love and appreciate each other. And don't forget old me. Don't forget to visit me sometimes. I shall look forward to your visits. Molly sincerely approved of her grandson's choice. During the girl's stay in the village, she saw that Mia is kind, hardworking, and intelligent. Therefore, William's grandmother was sure that Mia would be a great wife for her grandson. William was very happy to hear this. Finally, his life would change, and he would be happy with a woman who was perfect for him.